for more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Nearly two months after the general elections in Germany, the country is said to have a new government. The traffic light coalition, comprising the Social Democrats, the Greens and the Free Democrats under Olaf Scholz, will be sworn in in early December. There has been a lot of commentary on the very disparate nature of the coalition, which was formed after a protracted negotiation process. What is the character of this coalition and what are its contradictions? What has each party got and what compromises have they had to make? What kind of policies is the government likely to pursue and what impact could it have on the common people of Germany? Pavel Vargan, organizer, researcher and coordinator of the International Secretariat of the Progressive International based in Berlin talks about these issues. Um, as you say, we've had, uh, after the election, a long process, a long kind of complicated process of negotiating uh, the so-called traffic light coalition, which refers to the colors of the parties that will make up the new German government. You have the Social Democrats, who are red, the Free Democratic Party, a, a liberal kind of right-wing party, which is yellow, and then the Green Party, obviously green. Uh, and I think it's most instructive to start by looking at the institutional architecture of this traffic light coalition. So you have um, the SDP's Olaf Scholz, who will obviously take the chancellorship, the Social Dem Democratic Party, which came in the lead in the elections, and then the SDP will head six other ministries. But the key thing to look at was always going to be who controls the finance ministry, which is arguably the most important ministry in Europe and the historic uh, enforcer of the EU's austerity program. Um, the finance ministry is going to the Free Democrats uh, leader, Christian Lindner, who is a radical um, Austerian. Now, why does that matter? Well, first, it reflects, in my mind, the grotesquely undemocratic nature of the German system, right? A lot of Germans thought they were voting for change, and now it's clear that the most consequential political decisions are going to be taken by a right-wing party that got 11.5% of the vote, and whose leader was appointed to the role in a, in a shady backroom deal that was not open to the public. That's not democratic in my mind. But second, it means that there's now no chance that Germany will abandon the debt break, that constitutional limit on structural deficit, which operates as a, as a ceiling on public spending, um, or its insistence on enforcing that debt break across the European Union. And actually, on, on the contrary, if you read the coalition agreement, it says that Germany will continue to live up to its pioneering role um, as an anchor of stability, which is, of course, a euphemism for the destruction that it brought to countries like Greece and Italy and Portugal, uh, Ireland and, and Spain. Now, interestingly, um, because the Green Party rode this wave of climate concern, which has been around in Germany for a while, that uh, structural decision will be somewhat tempered, at least optically, by this classic sleight of hand, which is that the Green Party co-leader, Robert Habeck, will head a new climate and economy super ministry. Now, what we see here is this attempt to ram through this artificial separation of spending, which is controlled by the finance ministry, and the green economy, which is controlled by this new super, uh, super ministry. And in really rough terms, that separation of climate and finance mir mirrors the, the institutional architecture of the European Green Deal, which also splits uh, decisions on climate policy and decisions on financing with predictable effects. There's no money to spend on the green transition. Um, and um, a lot of the fun funding that's raised uh, comes through uh, various other mechanisms like public-private partnerships, which end up siphoning huge amounts of public money um, into private hands. Um, if you compare that now with uh, other policies in the coalition, uh, which got pushed through uh, on the insistence of both the Greens and the FDPs, like increased military spending, uh, paying back the debts incurred during the COVID crisis, uh, it's really not looking good. And this ideological uh, mishmash of parties that has kind of come to form this coalition looks like it's set to betray the core principles of every party and lead to a situation which is fundamentally not very different from the status quo. Uh, you've had several commitments on social justice, uh, increasing the minimum wage to 12 euros an hour, which, you know, a lot of companies already pay 12 euros an hour. The minimum wage was already going to go up next year. 
Um, and so that's not, uh, that's not as big a change as is being presented. Um, it's very difficult to see how with the commitment to militarization, uh, we can talk about that a bit later, and the commitment to repay debts and to maintain that uh, ceiling on public spending, that all of that is possible without further cuts uh, to public welfare. So uh, I don't believe, uh, you know, Olaf Scholz when he says that this is going to usher in a fundamental transformation of the German economy. I think um, it's going to be more stagnation, which is going to uh, mean further austerity and is likely to accelerate those, you know, those cent centrifugal forces that have been fueling the far right for a long time already. How is the new government likely to deal with strategic issues in the realm of foreign affairs? especially considering the various pulls Germany is facing from the US. What position is the new government likely to take towards the US? Will there be any strategic autonomy? Pavel explains. So I, I have long been warning um, about a danger of the, of the co-optation of the climate agenda by imperialism, in particular by the German Green Party, which I think is a case in point. You know, the, the German Greens in 1999 backed the NATO bombing campaign in Serbia. Uh, more recently, they've been promising to get tough on Russia and China, which is, uh, you know, very overtly aligning them with US foreign policy interests. It's enthusiastic about military spending, NATO spending, and so on. Um, and that alignment of Europe's most powerful economy with the agenda of US imperialism is, is incredibly dangerous, you know, at this point uh, in the new Cold War. It's incredibly dangerous. You know, there was, there was a poll that came out in August, um, I think, that showed that green voters were most likely of all parties, other than the FDP, which are also in the coalition, to support the US invasion of Afghanistan, in which Germany also took part. Now, make of that what you will. Um, now you have the Green Party's um, Annalena uh, Barbeck, who will run the foreign ministry. Um, and the coalition agreement makes, you know, her position within that, within that, uh, within the government clear. There's a commitment to the nuclear deterrent, there's a commitment to new fighter jets, there's a commitment to more drones, and so on and so forth. You know, if the, if the Social Democrats have one consistent political tradition that has survived the past century, it really is its repeated capitulation to imperialist interests. And now we have a situation where the coalition will fail to deliver on its already weak climate pledges because of the financing constraints implicit in the institutional architecture of the new government. And at the same time, the increasing uh, military budget could provide, I think, in the long run, the cudgel with which to limit migration, with which to discipline protesters, with which to distract from domestic failure through foreign policy adventurism. And that's the dangerous trajectory that I see implicit in green imperialism. You know, that's a, it's a politics that's green on the outside and, and brown on the inside. And they've already said things about reducing you know, irregular migration, increasing regular migration by supporting citizenship for skilled workers. So, so all the signs that they're going to align themselves in terms of foreign, foreign policy with some of the more reactionary currents in Europe are there and they're not looking promising. And finally, as a new government takes power, what is the situation of the left and other radical alternatives in Germany? The left did suffer a major setback in the elections. What space remains for oppositional forces? That's a difficult question. Uh, we know that in Germany in the last election, the left suffered a, a massive blow, uh, losing half of its seats. Um, we know that uh, you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the left forces have, had already been fatally weakened after the collapse of uh, the GDR and uh, this kind of total disaggregation of the left that followed and the loss of its material uh, and popular uh, base of support. And so it's very difficult to see. Now there are signs in places like Berlin, but Berlin is an island within Germany where you have radical movements for the expropriation of housing from mega landlords. But again, that's very specific to the conditions of Berlin. And uh, there are very, there's a very interesting phenomenon during the elections which points um, also to the shortcomings of, that, of those gains, which is that about half the people that voted for the expropriation of uh, properties from mega landlords also voted for parties in the elections that promised to veto that outcome um, if, uh, if the referendum went through. So it's very difficult today 
uh, to see uh, a pathway for the left, especially as the Social Democrats have been co-opting a lot of that energy and framing themselves as that left-wing force that is going to deliver the change, which it has clearly set itself up institutionally to fail.